Okay, and we're live. Um, this is Deacon Joseph Sweden. I do realize that I had said that last time would be the finale, and we are going to start working on NFTU's news channel. Unfortunately, it uh, will take a couple of days uh, to get approved, so that's going to be one thing. Um, I don't want to surprise everyone by changing this channel into that channel. That would be um, that would be wrong. Um, but part of the reason why I'm doing this is because in the last thing we did, the finale, um, somebody had asked in the chat, uh, do you know, uh, what do you have to say about the crimes of Marianne Sula Kiotis? Or, hold on, give me one second, I just have to shut off the chat on these things. And so, uh, I was like, I don't know who that is. Um, and I did not. Uh, because I did not know Abbas Mariam of Karatea's last name. So I couldn't know. Uh, but I'm not even going to pretend that um, I had some knowledge of a name or I had some knowledge of what this person was talking about, because the truth is I didn't. Um, so that led me to a little bit of research. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to go through uh, what I know and we're going to talk about it. This is, I hate to say this, but this is kind of a little bit less, um, less of uh, research as it is a little more detective work. So what I'd like to do is, uh, first off, I'm going to share, you know, I, since we're starting at ground zero with this, uh, I'm sharing basically what uh, I know and what I've learned and then more on it. So I'm going to, we'll start here. Um, if you go to, uh, if you look here, this is the Wikipedia for Mariam Sulakiotis, who is known as Abbas Mariam. It's short, so I could just read it. It says Mother Superior Mariam Sulakiotis. We would normally use the term Abbas, not Mother Superior. Also known as Mariam Sulakiotu, and in the press by the moniker The Woman Rasputin, we'll talk about that, was a Greek old calendarist abbess and convicted serial killer active between 1939 and 1951. Greek authorities indicted Sulakiotis in 1951 in, on charges including homicide, fraud, forgery of wills, blackmail, and torture. Sentenced to life in 1952, Sulakiotis died in Averroff prison in 1954. Sulakiotis was alleged to have committed a crime in the Peokovono Giatrisas Monastery near Karatea, Greece. As of 2008, the monastery remains open and still has members who believe she was innocent and venerate her as a saint. Um, okay, so we're gonna, we're going there, and so I'm gonna take that off, because it, it just goes through, it basically reiterates that she had apparently, like, you know, I guess, uh, supposedly tortured and killed a bunch of people, which, um, I'm gonna, I wanna get into that, uh, in a little bit, but, um, what I did was, I did what any of you would do, which is, I went to the, um, the bottom there, the, uh, the footnotes, and I started, reading and downloading, so on and so forth. Because uh, one of the things that I want to stress here um, is I do know the history of the true Orthodox churches pretty well. I'm not an expert. I'm no Vladimir Moss, but I'm, I do know them fairly well. And part of the reason I know them is because I've read a lot of the work of stuff like Vladimir Moss. And I'm not talking about my personal experience, but I've read through quite a bit of this stuff. And the reason I'm bringing this up is not because I'm trying to say, oh, I'm so smart. It's because I've never heard of this. That should, that gave me pause. You know, this is supposedly the, and according to the Wikipedia, I think it says something like prolific serial killer. Um, the point is, this is something that I would be expected to know. I would think most true orthodox, old calendarists, whatever you want to call us, would be expected to know about the largest mass murderer in Greek history, old calendarist history. Apparently, this nun killed more people than the new calendarist killed old calendarists. That's, that's just a crazy, crazy claim, but it says 177 victims or something like that, or 151 victims. That's an insane number. So insane is that number that it blows my mind that nobody bothered to mention this. I knew who Abbas Mariam was. I did not know about Mariam Sukliotis serial killer. That didn't happen. And so that led me down a rabbit hole where I started to um, I started to research to see what I could find. So of course you start with uh, you know the wiki page and we'll get down to the next thing which is uh, hold on let me see if I can uh, put this up here. 
I'm going to just switch the screen here. So the first of the links that we find here is, hold on. Okay, it's not allowing me to share anymore. There we go. So we're going to go here. Okay, so let's make this a little bit bigger. Okay, so this is an article from what appears to be Reuters. Uh, so that's why part of the reason why um, this particular article... Uh, so this is, you know, again, Reuters is an international news service. So the fact that I'm not seeing this in any of our histories is mind-blowing. But it goes through and it says, you know, Mother Miriam, age 71, dies in 1954 after being put in prison in 1952. Um, and basically, apparently the police were looking for a Greek-born American girl who disappeared in 49, never found the girl. They found an old woman dying locked up in a cell. The abbess was found to own 300 houses, farms throughout Greece, and gold and jewels worth thousands of pounds. The prosecution alleged she amassed the fortune by telling her nuns to will their property to her as the only way we could get, they could get into heaven was also claimed that she hastened the death of her nuns by imposing rigorous fasts and penances. A medical statement read to the court during the trial alleged that 177 men and women died in her convent. The old calendar of sect was outlawed in 1951. It broke away from the Greek Orthodox Church in 1923 when the latter adopted the Gregorian calendar. So that just had to be thrown in there for, uh, I guess, some um, you know, trivia purposes. But the point is, that is... Okay, so that's what we have basically, I guess you could say, on paper in terms of what kind of happened. So we have this, the 177 people dying. According to the court documents, it was only, it was like 20 people that she was actually accused of, I guess, killing, for lack of a better word. The other uh, 100-something people uh, died of tuberculosis because of the conditions in the monastery. So that led me to thinking, in the first place, uh, tuberculosis being a communicable disease, uh, I was like, okay, so, you know, this monastery was so dirty and ratchet that it just had, like, tuberculosis everywhere, and so Mother Miriam's throwing these people in these cells or whatever filled with tuberculosis, and they're all dying of tuberculosis and willing their property to the monastery. First off, the fact that the, that the monastery amassed 300 properties, I admit, sketch, I'm not I'm not even going to try to say that that's uh, typical. It's atypical. Um, you know, how could so many people die of tuberculosis and will their stuff to the monastery? And why, among all the old calendar's histories, does nobody know this? Why is this? Why I looked for this, and one of the sources that was put uh, was uh, Gregory of Colorado's website. And so I noticed that Gregory of Colorado includes this great mass murder, so on and so forth. And I'm like, I've read Gregory of Colorado's website a few times. I don't remember him ever talking about this. So I started digging back into the archive, and I found that he really never talked about this until like 2019. And so I was like, how, wait, how is it that the guy who writ, wrote articles left and right about the evils of the Matthewites just kind of left out the biggest mass murderer in Greece until two years ago? Well, that led me to be a little more suspicious. I mean, if anyone would want to put something up like that, it would be Gregory of Colorado. And yet I can't find him more than a couple of years having actually any mention of this. And so this kind of compounded the whole memory whole thing. I'm like, okay, how did everybody in the old calendar miss this? It's impossible. For me, it's impossible. I mean, I, I'm the I'm all big on transparency, so I would have been like, you know, I would, whoa, murder none, you know, but this uh, it gets a little bit more complicated as we continue going through. Now, a lot what I'm going to show you now are more links that are from the bottom of the wiki article. They're translated from the Greek, so we're going to start with this article here. And if you look, this was an article that was um, put up. Hold on, let me share it. Uh, this is the hell of Karatea Monastery and its bloodthirsty abbess. So if we look at the date of this, this was written on, uh, you know, April 2nd, 2017. So that's about four years old. So you have a picture. There's lots and lots and lots of nuns. Um, in the Karatea Monastery, the Middle Ages has revived. 
adult and child abuse, torture, property abuse. I don't even know what property abuse is. Fear, death. All had this terrible case surrounded by religious fanaticism bringing to mind the tortures of the Middle Ages. Now, I'm not going to be, um, I'm not going to be too, I don't want to be too uh, uncritical. Um, if, one thing that I must mention is that physical violence at times is part of monastic history. You can even find it in monastic rules. I'm not justifying what happened. But, um, so I'm looking here, and so they arrested, you know, the, well, they called her the female Satan. Apparently she upgraded from Rasputin to Satan. Uh, several nuns and the old calendar bishop were arrested. And so then it says, you know, this is the prosecutor. Carrot is a disgrace for Greece. The hairs on my head stand up. Imagine that 150 tuberculosis girls died there. All right, so... Now we know that the overwhelming majority of these people died of tuberculosis, which would have been caused by uh, Abbas Miriam, the murder nun, Satan, whatever you want to call her. But the point is, supposedly she caused the tuberculosis that killed them or put them in the conditions of tuberculosis. And I thought about this because I started thinking, that's a little bit strange. It's a little bit strange. I've never heard of somebody doing mass killings using a disease until the U.S. government with COVID. But um, the point is, that's going to probably get this channel banned. Uh, but the point is that um, there's something fishy about this. As this continues, the torture was gone. They all talk about, by, I noticed this was very interesting in both the articles that were in the Google Translate thing. They have to mention that they covered Bishop Matthew with perfume to make his uh, tomb seem fragrant. And the reason that they have to bring this up is because it's well known among the Matthewites that when they opened his tomb, it was claimed to be fragrant. So they're saying it was Miriam who covered it with perfume to deceive the pious and create a legend around his name. Uh, having smelled fragrant, you know, tombs before, that's a really hard feat. But let's assume, let's assume they're telling the truth that she somehow admitted to this, which she does not claim, by the way. Um, and so the most common way of torturing Marianne's victims was, was to turn them upside down from the trees with one purpose, to get the demons out of the body and purify the faithful. I admit that's weird. I do not justify it if it happened. Uh, wake up young children with barbaric beatings in order to purify them. Also not cool. Uh, only in this way could they attend the divine services free from demons and realize the greatness of the Christian religion. Okay, so to understand correctly, they beat the kids before divine liturgy just to get the demons out. Okay, so this is, keep in mind that most of what you're hearing here is courtroom testimony from people who were formerly in Karatea. So these are the accusations that they're throwing here. Um, this one has a 10-year-old girl who licked a potato and apparently ended up all night in a stable. Um, and so she describes how her mother was forbidden to have any communication with the outside world. Okay, so this is a, a family member of somebody who was the daughter of an inmate? I presume that would be, uh, you know, either a monastic or something. Um, so Miriam was convicted of a number of crimes, including fraud, forgery, extortion, and murder. The deaths were many. A tuberculous woman, as soon as she realized the insidious way of Mar Miriam, wanted to escape from the monastery, but the abbess locked her in a slum with minimal food for six months, resulting in her death. A couple who gave him his property died of starvation in the monastery, so on and so forth. So this is where we're, this, the press of the time vividly described what was happening even several years after the revelation of the scandal. Now, this is the part that gets me. This is a period in the history of the True Orthodox of Greece where there is a lot of movement, a lot of stuff going on. And what I mean by that is you could get a lot of data. And yet, somehow, this vividly described thing for years doesn't appear until the latter part of the 2010s. That doesn't make sense to me. But we're going to go, so we continue. Miriam denied all the charges and claimed that what was attributed to her were satanic constructions, claiming that people came to the monastery to save their souls. Hearing the verdict for her imprisonment, it seems she said, I was unjustly convicted. I have a clear conscience toward God that I did my duty toward these weak creatures who accused me of the trial. She died two years later in prison at the age of 71. So what we're looking at now is that's one article. So we're going to stop this one. I'm going to get to the next article. Um, and this is another one that was translated, another Google Translate, uh, because these articles are in Greece. So let me see here. Is it this one? I think so. Yes. The nun serial killer, Mariam of Karatea. So, all right. So here we have the serial killer. I want to point out again, if you notice here, that's a lot of nuns. And there's a reason I'm pointing that out. 
Um, Greece at the end of 1950, and the horrific her history of Caratale Monastery comes to life. So 85 police officers and a prosecutor invade the monastery, release a bunch of rich elderly women held in bad condition along with 36 boys and girls. An unprecedented scene of horror is sent to there. Hundreds of people are tortured to death by the abbess Mariam Sukuliyoti to be sent sinlessly to Sulakiyoti, excuse me, to be sent sinlessly to paradise after their family property had first passed into the hands of the monastery. And so it goes through here. Here we go again talking about Bishop Matthew's corpse and how, you know his uh, whether his remains were fragrant, but according to this, of course, she just sprinkled him with lots of perfume, which really, if you have actually experienced any fragrant, that just doesn't make sense. Um, anyway, so we're talking about more and more tortures. These are apparently formerly people from the monastery. Okay, those are kids dressed as nuns. I assume they were novices or not novices, uh, you know, like um, what do you call those workers? Um, and then you have these lots of nuns here. And so these people uh, contracted tuberculosis after starving. And then this guy died of tuberculosis. I'm like, so how is how does Abbas Mariam weaponize tuberculosis? I, I am familiar with the fact that tuberculosis is a 20th century plague. Uh, so this is why I became a little bit more concerned. This occurred in 1952. Greece in the 1950s, um, I mean, they were still using donkeys. If you look for any history of Greece at that time, they're... They, they weren't totally modernized, and it was post-war Greece, so they were trying to rebuild. Um, so it's not we're not talking, I mean, I don't want to compare it to a third world country, but it's pretty close in many cases throughout Europe. Now, I'm not justifying anything. I'm simply making a point. The reason I bring that up is because um, I started to look up, well, okay, when was tuberculosis treated? You know, when did that occur? And so that started me on some, you know, uh, great quest to find when uh, tuberculosis was finally taken care of. And because, you know, I mean, if you're going to mark someone guilty of tuberculosis murder for 150 people, then, you know, that that is kind of important. So, of course, I, I went through some things and I got to an abstract. And this says of all achievements in medicine, this is, uh, by the way, uh, treatment of tuberculosis, a historical perspective. Uh, it's Annals of the American Thoracic Society. Um, the first step in finding a cure was the discovery of the cause by Robert Koch in 1882. The anti-tuberculosis benefit of streptomycin was announced in 1945, although application was limited by the rapid development of resistance. So they, they discovered in 1945, when you combine with streptomycin, it could reduce the occurrence of drug resistance. In 1952, ionized Isoniazid opened the modern era of treatment. It was inexpensive, well-tolerated, and safe. In the 1960s, ethambutol was shown to be effective and better tolerated. So now, if we got to go back to the timeline here because that means, remember, this says that, um, you know, if we look at that wiki, um, she was, you know, Miriam was active as a serial killer between 1939 and 1951 which would fall right as when they were just discovering the treatment of tuberculosis. Certainly, they were discovering it in the first world, um, not in the third world. And I don't want to bring this up to be a pain, but the point is that I want to emphasize this further because I'm going to kind of point that out again. Okay, so that I did treatment of tuberculosis. Um, yeah, this is PubMed. So this says the major historical landmarks of tuberculosis therapy include the discovery of effective medications in 1944, the revelation of triple therapy, streptomycin, para, um, para aminosalicylic acid, and isoniazid in 1952. Now, 1952 is when Abbas Miriam went to jail. So they didn't actually have a cure for tuberculosis until the year she went to jail. So somehow... She's been prosecuted for killing people for a disease that nobody knows how to treat. Are we starting to see why this is a little bit weird? Um, if you can't, if you can't control tuberculosis, or that that would that would be the question. Can she control tuberculosis? Didn't Mother Miriam know how to get people tuberculosis infected and so on and so forth? Because that would be a visible and, ex, you know, I guess you could say a prosecutable, a prosecutable crime, a crime that would be capable of prosecution. Um, and this was where 
the worst of this popped out, and that was that I found an article written in 1946, um, written by a doctor in Greece, um, called Tuberculosis in Greece, Present Conditions and Future Considerations. And I'm going to share that article because it does give a picture of Greece at the time. And so I'm going to put that up here. And so it says, this is by Dr. Peter Theodos, um, Theodos Peter, uh, and it was written uh, in Diseases of the Chest in 1946, Volume 12, Issue 6. And it says, number one, tuberculosis is the single most important sin health problem in Greece today and is three to five times more serious now than in pre-war. Two, it is not epidemic at present, but chronic malnutrition, overcrowding, lack of shelter, economic privation, and depletion of physical reserve make the threat a grave one. The tuberculosis deaths are well over 35,000 a year, and the estimated morbidity, 460,000 in a population of 7,300. Incidence rates for urban areas are 3% active and 7% inactive lesions, 1.5% and 3.5% respectively for rural areas. There is a critical shortage of at least 30,000 tuberculosis beds and 30 dispensaries. This shortage can best be met by the use of prefabricated buildings. Economic difficulties have caused voluntary organizations to curtail their activities, lose their initiative, and try to rely more and more on governmental subsidies. Popular prejudice and fear of tuberculosis is considerable, and health education is lacking. The well-conceived anti-tuberculosis program of pre-war Greece, keep in mind this anti-tuberculosis program did not have a cure, so it was a treatment with the hope of keeping people better, has been torn asunder and rendered ineffective by the, effects of, uh, the events of the past five years. Present control activities are directed towards equi exi equipping existing sanatorium dispensaries, opening new ones, elevating standards, introducing mass miniature roach and roach genography, and the formation of a National Tuberculosis Association of Greece. The Greek government is unable to undertake its financial responsibilities as regards to uh, tuberculosis and must be assisted by outside help. The problem of tuberculosis in Greece is not a local one and must be considered by any new health organization to be set up by the United Nations organization. In other words, it was really, really bad in Greece. Tuberculosis was terrible. Now, this is uh, in, an important detail because if you're going to say that the greatest serial killer of all time killed people with tuberculosis when tuberculosis was already rampant in Greece, something's not honest here. Something's not okay. Um, it is, and I hate to say this, I did not say this when I first read these things because I was not 100%. I mean, okay, sure, she maintained her innocence. Lots of people who commit murders maintain their innocence. But the fact that tuberculosis was already rampant in Greece, but they're somehow pinning it on an old nun that just happens to be an old calendarist with a lot of property that they don't like, it's plausible. It's plausible. Um, and that, that's unfortunate because, you know, the simple reality is maybe she was a really rough abbess. I mean, one of the sources is Scott Nevin's suicide. Now, Scott Nevin's was a, um, he was somebody who wanted to become a monk or something like that. And I guess he, I forget the story, but the point is he ends up killing himself. Um, he was with, uh, going to an Ephraimite monastery and his family basically started this whole like memorial thing that has to do with all the evil practices of monastics, whether old calendars, new calendars, you name it. Um, and so the point is, uh, if monastic practices as a whole are condemned as bad and violent, and then you pin that on an abbess, uh, the point is, you're not just condemning Abbas Miriam. You're condemning a lot of people, um, people who use these ancient practices. You're condemning St. Benedict. He put the beating thing in his rule. Um, suffering Orthodoxy asked, do you think she was framed by the minions of Satan? Um, well, you know, I mean, it depends on how you feel about the Greek government post-war. Um, if they were, you know, minions of Satan, then yeah. I mean, I'm, I don't know if she was framed, but she was certainly... Uh, it sounds to me more and more like uh, that really what happened was um, it was a very, you know, diseased period and ep almost epidemic period of tuberculosis. And um, people did donate their properties to monasteries at the end of their lives. This is something that they did. But to kind of blame her for the tuberculosis is a little bit deceptive. Um, so the point is, it, it starts to really look questionable. Like, if this was occurring in any monastery that was, I guess you could say, approved 
uh, you know, an official monastery. There are lots of monasteries who do stuff like this, unfortunately. Um, but they don't just don't happen to, you know, have it in a time of an epidemic that kills people really fast. Uh, unfortunately, that was the time period that Mother Miriam was in. Uh, again, I'm not a Matthewite. I'm not, you know, I have no dog in this fight. <laughs> so, but it doesn't look to me like she did anything particularly strange. It looks to me like they're pinning deaths on her that probably weren't avoidable anyway. Lots of people go to monasteries for healing, and many of those people might have already had tuberculosis because you can clearly see that. And I, I hate to say this, but she can't be found guilty of not being a medical expert and, and a psychic medical expert because there was no cure until 1952 when she was put in jail. So she can't be like accused of not knowing the rules of the sanatorium. She was a nun. I, I don't even know if she had a high school education, but the point is she can't really be accused of doing anything that was wildly unmonastic. Um, you know, I, I hate to say that, but that's simply how things go. And that may not be the answer people want to hear. Um, but that's, probably and most likely based on what i can see the truth um so i don't know that um this is a really good argument uh one of the other links i clicked on that was there supposedly there was going to be more evidence um you know that was on this thing and it was in a footnote so let me just go to that screen and it supposedly that it talked about her guilt and whatever and i went to it and so it was just literally like a giant argument for the new calendar and how systematic i even tried to search for Miriam. she's not even listed she's not even here it's just a random article that's trying to defend the new calendar so that shouldn't even be in the wiki article for fun um and just because i wanted to you know verify even further um my suspicions which as i mentioned at the beginning of this was that gregory of colorado didn't even mention it you know, until a couple of years ago that nobody knew. I was like, well, how long has this wiki article been there? I mean, that it must have been there a while. And so I um, I went and checked it. And so I was like, okay, so let's go to this wiki article and we can see when it was created. And voila, what a surprise. Uh, the article was created in 2019. Somehow, the biggest mass murderer in modern Greek history was unknown until two years ago and so and obviously very quietly there's, there's no real knowledge of this really comes to light and this sort of um accusation like i just got hit with it when i did the finale and it's like what do you think of her crimes no one knew about her crimes as a matter of fact she may not have had any crimes but the point is they've created it because they're taking advantage of mass ignorance if you, we live in a society where tuberculosis has been pretty much wiped out, it's really easy to say, did you know this nun killed people with tuberculosis 70 years ago? Except the problem is that 70 years ago, there was no treatment for tuberculosis, and she wasn't like that scientifically knowledgeable. So to even make that argument is a bad argument. Um, you don't find anything in this until 2019. How does that happen? How does that happen? And I just leave you to ask that question because if this sort of claim that could have very well just been the Greek government persecuting her because she had a lot of property um, is now being propagated as proof of a murder, uh, that she was a mass murderer, I find it most interesting that you can't find a history for it that isn't more than two or three years old. So this is an example of taking modern ignorance of historical crises and in this case it would be a you know a historical epidemic of you know uh of disease in greece so the disease tuberculosis um and then flipping history to make a narrative and that's wrong uh it's just that's it's that simple that that is wrong um and it shouldn't be done uh but this is par for the course uh in arguing over you know people arguing over the calendar we have to take it to the craziest level why because otherwise you have to admit okay the greek government under the new calendar has murdered catherine Routis and other people um who's you know a martyr for our church so on and so forth and they're like no 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 we got to come up with something better so they make up this thing about you know mother miriam being you know a murderer even though most of the people she supposedly murdered died of tuberculosis which she couldn't control and no one had a cure for um, because you, as the modern listener, you as the modern reader of the internet, will fall for it.
because you have to use critical thinking. Um, and in that, this particular case, you have to do a little bit of digging in history. Um, I'm not going to say that I consider Mother Miriam innocent. I don't know. What I am going to say is that there's a lot of motivation for the Greek government at the time to prosecute her, and a lot of the claims that are being made don't add up when you put them with history. With that, I think I can, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say goodbye again, and I will be putting up a link. Uh, I know I said I'd put up more links before. I will be putting up a link to the NFTU News channel once we have that going. But I did want to clarify this because um, I had never heard of it, and uh, now I'm starting to see why. And it's because of the fact that had you tried making this claim in Greece in 1950, uh, you know, what the media was saying, uh, that's why there were still a million old calendars, but they don't even bring it up because they knew tuberculosis was happening. But we don't. So it's just taking advantage of historical ignorance. Um, so that's the note I'm going to leave it on today. There's, uh, you know, not much else to say. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being there. And I hope that uh, this clarifies, uh, you know, at least the strange situation of Abbas Miriam. I am not going to jump in there and say she's a saint like the nuns in her monastery in Karatea was. Oh, yeah, that's the last thing that was really weird. If She was like this crazy murderer, so on and so forth. This is an Orthodox country uh, with a lot of Orthodox people, and she had a lot of nuns, and there's still a lot of nuns. And many of the old ones obviously say she was innocent. But here's my question. How is it that none of them managed to notice? Um, and then, uh, okay, Suffering Orthodoxy writes, you should look into Herman Podmashinsky and Father Paisius de Lucia and that scandal. Um, I actually have not, I don't know who Father Paisius de Lucia is. I do know who Father Herman Podmashinsky is. And from what I understand in uh, letters from Father Sheriff, he anathematizes Father Herman um, you know, on the accusation that he was, uh, he was, um, uh, gaying, uh, novices. And so, you know, he was abusing novices and trying to turn them. Uh, and it, you know, the history there with Father Seraphim and Father Herman, unfortunately, it's not unbelievable. Uh, again, I'm not one to, you know, turn around and say, oh, you know, this person is damned or this person's sa a saint. But the point is, these things are usually more complex than a simple reading gives. And I say that because we like saying orthodoxy is simple, but we forget lying is also simple. And so we have to be careful, especially when we're throwing out accusations against clergy, especially accusations of, I don't know, murder. Um, so that's something that, you know, uh, should be taken into account and all evidence should be looked at. And so I think that's all I have to say on the matter. And, um, you know, Take care. Happy Feast of the Fathers of the First Ecumenical Council. And may we all make it to Pentecost. Christ is ascended. And have a great afternoon.